Julius Irving, also known as Dr. J, is widely regarded as one of the greatest basketball players of all time, known for his high-flying acrobatics on the court, including his signature dunk from the free throw line. During his career, he played for both the ABA and the NBA, winning three championships, four MVP awards, and earning 16 all-star selections. Julius is also credited with helping to popularize the slam dunk and make making it a staple of the game of basketball. Off the court, he has been a successful businessman and philanthropist. But we aren't here to talk about any of that. I mean, we are, but we're going to look at it all. His love stories, the romantic controversies, and the dream team he ultimately created. So in short, yes, we're going to talk about it. Whatever that it is for you. <laughs> a quick disclaimer, we're going to be discussing a lot of very sensitive and possibly triggering matters on this episode. So if you're around children or if certain topics just don't make you feel comfortable, I would suggest you skip this episode. Hey everyone, welcome back All Runners. If you're new in the pews, this is I'll Tell You What. I'll Tell You What is a weekly podcast that shares the weddings, marriages, and romances of Black figures throughout time. We bask on these relationships not to be messy, but to remind you of the passion in our past and to humanize the people we put on pedestals. Basically, it's all love, Black history, and I'm Ashley, your favorite rock and tooth that tells you these stories every single Monday. Welcome to the 13th episode of I'll Tell You What. We must begin with the love story of Julius Irving and Turquoise Brown. I'm sure you know about it or at least some parts of this story, but it doesn't matter. Let's go back. So before he was Dr. J, he was Julius Winfield Irving II, the son of the first Julius, a man also known as Tonk, and Callie May. Tonk was the kind of dad that would come around occasionally and actually die when Julius was a child. He was primarily raised with his his two siblings, an older sister and a younger brother, by his mom alone until she married his stepfather, Dan Lindsay. But in the early 1970s, Julius was a second year small forward for the Virginia Squires, an ABA team. This was before the NBA merger, if you didn't know. He'd recently ended a long-term relationship with his college girlfriend, Carol. He said in his autobiography that after a game, he met a few girls that were there, and one of the girls was this last skin lady kind of around his sister's complexion named Turquoise. Now she would tell Ebony Magazine that they met on February 9th, 1972. They passed each other on the street earlier in the day and later saw each other again at a party. Regardless of actually how they met, Julius was really taken by her beauty and wanted to know more about her. Turquoise at the time was a single mom of a seventh month old. She resided in North Carolina, not Virginia, and they would actually get each other numbers and later he'd invite her back to stay the weekend with him. She accepts the offer and brings her homegirl. So now you know he realizes what that means and finds someone to try to take the homegirl to the movies so he could spend some one-on-one -on -one time with her boys. So with a friend out of the house it actually allowed them to just be able to have a night together. They talked. Yep that's what they did. They talked all night long. Turquoise was like, I just met you. I am not a groupie. And actually he learned a lot about her that weekend. And the more he did, the more he was intrigued. The more intrigued he became. He said, quote, I'm smitten. And that night before we've even slept together, I know that this woman is something special. They begin to date and he's falling for her fast. And the feeling must have been mutual because it doesn't take long before she tells him that she's pregnant and is his. He already knew that he wanted this relationship to work, so he moved Turquoise and her son Chio up with him. Though the 70s were becoming a more progressive time, something didn't quite set right with them living together and having a baby out of wedlock. 
Whitlock. Plus, his mom wasn't a fan of it either. So in October of that year, in their condo, Julius asked Turquoise to marry him. And of course, she said yes. They decided to get married the following February. They wanted an intimate, private wedding at the Americana Inn. But I've told y'all before, and I will tell you again, there's always something that goes wrong on your wedding day. You can't control it. It doesn't matter who you are, how much money you make, how much you've planned this wedding down to the bones, something will go wrong. It's not indicative that your marriage will be doomed. It's just something that literally happens to everyone. You just have to adjust and you'll be okay. So for them, news got out about their wedding and fans and media began to surround the area. Meanwhile, Turquoise, I assume, was getting ready at the hotel and realized that that this would be a madhouse for Julius to try to get there. So they had a change of plans. She called him and told him to meet her in the officiant at the Waldorf Astoria. I have no idea how Turquoise was able to leave the hotel without anyone knowing, but regardless, they got a last minute suite at the hotel and after midnight in front of Julius's childhood friend and his friend's girlfriend and then his dentist and his dentist's wife, Julius and Turquoise got married. He said they toasted with champagne and potatoes potato chips. And officially, that marked the beginning of the married life of Julius and Turquoise Irvin. Before the controversies and the scandals, Dr. J or Julius and wife Turquoise Irving navigated marriage, parenthood, and life as black people ascending to the upper class. As they began to have children, first with the adoption of Turquoise's son Chio, then Julius III, then Jasmine, and then finally their son Corey, they quickly realized that their childhoods were drastically different than the ones of their children. Julius mentioned in his autobiography, some Something that a good friend of his told him that always stood out. Quote, Bill Cosby told me that nothing about growing up poor teaches you how to be a rich dad. This is something he'd grapple with as most of the parenting, including the disciplining, was left up to Turquoise as he was frequently away at work. Because as you know, Julius's job would ultimately take him to several locations. When he met Turquoise, he was playing in Virginia and shortly after they were married, he was playing for the New York Nets. And by the time his daughter Jasmine was born, Julius was in the NBA playing for the Philadelphia 76ers. His introduction to the team started off somewhat rocky, which led Turquoise to get something off her chest. So seeing how her husband wasn't fully embraced in this new work environment, she wanted to opine publicly. And since there wasn't like Instagram or Twitter, she had to do what folks did back then when they wanted to say something, go to the press. She worked with a sports writer named Samantha Stevenson on the opinion piece that was ultimately printed in the New York Times. The essay titled The Regrets of a Player's Wife lamented on how the team wasn't accepting of him like New York was and how he had so much to give and so much potential there. And honestly, have you ever worked somewhere where someone new started and they always complain about how this job doesn't do things like their old job does? Yeah, it's annoying. And low-key that's how I interpreted that article. I know turquoise probably meant well but not everybody saw it that way. Eventually Julius will settle into a rhythm in Philly and turquoise would try to create some normalcy for her family. They found community among other like-minded black celebrities like Teddy Pendergrass, Bill and Camille Cosby obviously and through them Eartha Kitt, Miles Davis, James Earl Jones just to name a few. And knowing the type of impulses her husband's career exposed him to, Turquoise would tell Ebony Magazine, quote, I just worked very hard and made up in my mind that no matter what, outside influencers were not going to pull us apart and they were only going to pull us closer. And they did. Despite her saying this, Julia said she would occasionally accuse her friends of flirting with him and vice versa. He recalled a moment where he was picking up one of her friends from the airport, but because of the flight delay, they arrived at the house over an hour later. Turquoise was upset with both Julius and her friend, though that moment was out of anyone's control and she barely talked to either one of them throughout the entire trip. And even though Turquoise would insinuate that her husband was not being 
faithful, there would be rumors that she wasn't as well. For instance, you might have heard the rumor that mentioned that she was in the car with Teddy Pendergrass when his car crashed, but actually that was not the case. She was at home in bed, sleep with Julius when the accident occurred. And actually Julius and Turquoise went to the hospital the very next morning to see their friend. And there he explained the truth of what happened that night. But we're not here to talk about that. However, there was some reason behind Turquoise's fears. Though he tried in the early stages of their relationship and marriage, eventually Julius would succumb to the thief of many marriages in fidelity. Dr. J, or Julius Irving, cheated on his wife. He said he would categorize women in two ways. Quote, the good girl you wanted home to provide and care for, and the bad girl from across the way whose only need is for me to unbuckle her skin-tight jeans. Being unfaithful wasn't new territory for him, not to say he was an expert at cheating, but when Julius was with his college girlfriend, he became more aware of the temptations in front of him. That plus the long distance and the long distance that made him more susceptible to said temptations is what ultimately made him call off the relationship. Now the woman Julius found companionship in was someone he encountered at work. He said she was a quote pretty white girl that gave off a vibe of quote availability. She was a writer. Actually the writer that ghost wrote the essay turquoise pinned to the New York Times after Julius joined the 76ers. Samantha Stevenson. Julius said that his relationship to Sam as he called her was a quote, a kind of therapy, which could mean some of the liberties of the relationship without obligations of marriage. He admitted that they only got intimate once because she had just gotten braces, but outside of that, most of their fooling around was just that. But Turquoise wasn't dumb. According to Philly Magazine, quote, when Turquoise would find out about another woman, she'd confront him. Turquoise doesn't take anything lying down, and he'd stop seeing her, but she didn't know about Samantha. So sometime later, Later, months after Turquoise gave birth to their fourth child, Corey, Julius receives a letter from Sam. She had a daughter named Alexandra Winfield Stevenson, and it says Samantha told ESPN that she notified him beforehand and hoped that he would arrive at the hospital to meet their child, but he didn't. Allegedly, she began to call the house looking for Julius. She told the housekeeper not to tell Turquoise she called, but the housekeeper obliviously ignored her. Turquoise listened on the phone when Samantha call back. You do remember those days of the landline phone and picking up and listening in on someone's conversation? Turquoise listened and learned that her husband not only philandered, but philandered with someone she knew and that act created a baby. So she asked him about it and he denied it. Julia said he was the one that confessed to Turquoise and sis was heated. He said he let her read the letter and then she began to start swinging, allegedly. She's hurling expletives out of her mouth and throwing dinner aware of him at the same time. And he gets a DNA test, which confirms paternity and Turquoise tells him exactly how this situation will be remedied. Draw up an agreement with a lawyer with the following conditions. Samantha must live at least 200 miles away from Julia's. She should not report on the birth of their child nor allow the news of their child to become public or known. Alexandra will get a car at 16. He will pay for her private school tuition. And in exchange, Julius would provide them $4,000 a month. The kids of Julius and Turquoise would not know of this. Only the three adults and their lawyers. This was their little secret. Hey, you know that I also have another podcast with my best friend, right? It's called Who I Do, and it's a podcast that realistically helps brides with the emotional, physical, and financial thrills and stressors of wedding planning. Our fifth season is starting up next Wednesday on August 23rd, 2023, and I can't wait. So if you're planning your wedding or you know someone that is, tell them about Who I Do. You can find Who I Do wherever you listen to podcasts, and soon, on the tube of you as well. Go ahead and subscribe. Dr. J, or Julius Irving, always wanted to have a lot of children. After his wife Turquoise had their third child, Jasmine, he said he wanted to have three more. By 1981, he was just one child away. 
After the discovery of Julius' secret love child, he would continue his life as normal with his wife Turquoise. A few years later, the 76ers would finally win a champion after a 15 plus year drought. Turquoise would continue to hold the home down and to show how much he loved and appreciated her. In 1986, Julius threw her a surprise birthday party on a yacht. Now on the other side of the country, Samantha was the present single mom in a predominantly white area that would take her brown daughter back and forth to school on a bicycle. Alexandra knew who her father was by the time she was four years old. She would reject most conversations about him, mostly due to his absence. He never sent Christmas cards or birthday cards or gifts or anything. But when she was eight years old, Julius was conducting a basketball clinic near her. She wanted to go. Perhaps she wanted to meet him, see this larger than life invisible father figure up close in person. One of her mom's friends took her. Her name was proudly displayed on a name tag. Alexandra stood out naturally, being taller than the other kids there, and Julius recognized her as one of the best athletes of the day. He didn't know who she was at the time. It wasn't until he looked down and saw the name tag that it clicked. In the back of the gym was his wife Turquoise, who also realized who this child was and allegedly fainted. That moment didn't create a father-daughter relationship, as you would imagine. Alexandra would continue to resent him and the Irvings returned to the East Coast and the realities of their life there. For instance, their sons were getting into trouble. Julius said he realized that he would try to overcompensate his absence by trying to fix things with money, like putting them into other schools if they got kicked out or got into trouble, putting them into rehab, etc. And he would learn that these solutions weren't always permanent. But by 1987, he would retire from the league, and by 1993, he would be inducted into the Hall of Fame. After a stint of basketball commentary as a sports news analyst, he was offered offered a role as the executive VP of operations for the Orlando Magic. This meant leaving Philadelphia, but was something that sounded exciting to him. Turquoise, on the other hand, didn't want to go. She wanted to stay and have their youngest, Corey, finish high school with his friends. Julius asked her if they were separating. Their marriage at this point seemed to have an asterisk by it. He knew that being apart would open the door to more temptation, but he went to Florida anyway. When Julius Irving was working as a VP for the Orlando Magic and was hundreds of miles away from his wife that was raising their youngest child at their home in Philadelphia, he met an attractive Honduran woman at the airport. He gives her his business card and invites her to a game. She accepts the invitation and he asks her out, just the two of them, to go see soul food. He's drawn to her and the relationship begins. Life for Julius would be a whirlwind during this time, however, because while that relationship was starting to flourish, Julius and Turquoise's youngest graduates high school and they both decide to move down to Florida. Now, Corey is starting to come into his own after having some troubles in the past, but things seem hopeful though. That would change. One day, Julius and Turquoise were having a barbecue. Turquoise asked Corey to go grab some bread from his job. He left and didn't come home after a few hours. Now, they assumed he was back on that stuff or up to his old antics, but when he didn't return home the next day, nor reached out, they started to panic, naturally. All of the worst case scenarios ran through their minds. He wouldn't just run away. Now, you might have remembered Corey's disappearance was all over the news. Julius even went on Larry King Live, pleading with America to help find his son. This went on for over a month. About 40 days later, after he left home to get bread, Corey was discovered in a retention pond in a development about a mile away from home. It was assumed that he tried taken a shortcut, but the path of construction in the area might have changed from the last time he drove through it, so he might have come across the pond when it was too late to do anything about it. He died by accidental drowning. But for Corey's death, however, the news came out about Julius and his secret daughter, Alexandra. You see, Alexandra was actually climbing the ranks as a tennis star, and her parents began to make people question her paternity. Now, it was obvious that her mom is white and she has brown skin, so who could the daddy be? It was a thing that was initially questioned behind closed doors, but in 1997, at a tournament, Charles Bricker, a writer from the Fort Lauderdale 
Royal Sun Sentinel went up to her and asked, who's your dad? And she responded, none of your business. That writer would not let it go. He recalled something that her mom Sam wrote in 1986 that alluded to her daughter having champion blood in her. Now what black athlete could be the peppy? Charles was able to purchase her birth certificate, I believe for like less than a dollar. And lo and behold, the answer was right there. In 1999, the story would be published that Alexandra was actually Julius's daughter. He initially denied it. Well, actually, he wouldn't confirm nor corroborate the story. This just added fuel to the fire. So Julius knew he had to do a few things. One, he had to come forward to his children to let them know about his daughter, their sister. And two, he released a statement confirming paternity. So imagine your husband's secret daughter is now an internationally known secret. Your youngest child is dead before what you feel like was his time. And your husband comes to you with another bombshell. He's had another child out of wedlock. After the death of their youngest child and the news that Julius Irving now had two children out of wedlock, Turquoise finally chose herself and filed for divorce. Their almost 30 year marriage had come to an end. Their divorce, as you can imagine, was a little messy. In the proceedings, Julius admitted to making another house call and fathering another child and was paying $2,000 a month in child support. Allegedly, someone in someone's camp leaked an old cess tape of Julius with him and someone that wasn't turquoise in a hotel room. Now, turquoise would receive $1,500 a week in temporary alimony, $8,000 a month for credit card expenses, and money for household expenses. She also asked to keep their $1.1 million home in Florida. And a lot of this was dragged out publicly. I'm sure some of you probably remember this as well. But with that marriage behind him, Julius does a few things. He marries Doris or Doris. I don't know how it was pronounced, but the mother of his youngest child, who is also the woman he met at the airport that day in Orlando when he was directionally separated to Turquoise. And Doris and Julius would actually go on to have two more children. Also, Julius established a relationship with his daughter Alexandra over two decades later. Alexandra spent so much of her life with internal conflict due to the absence of her father. She expected him to call and make up for lost time and he didn't know how to approach the relationship so he didn't. Now my personal opinion is that it's always the parent's responsibility or the older relative to reach out and pick up the phone. But Anyway, they both stubbornly waited for each other to make the first move, but it was Alexandra that eventually would be the one to call Julius. Their relationship started off slowly as Alexandra had to learn to trust him. And in a feature article about the two of them for ESPN, they say they're working on getting to that father daughter place. Now, this was written some time ago, so not too sure how much their relationship has fared since, but they don't follow each other on Instagram. So, and that all runners concludes the love story of Julia's Dr. J Irving. If any of this interests you, I would highly suggest you read the following his autobiography, which was an amazing read, like so, so good in a quick read as well. Of course, it was written by Dr. J himself, Julius Irving and Carl Taro Greenfield. You can also read this really great article about the relationship of Julius Irving and his daughter, Alexandra Stevenson called Reaching Out by Tom Friend. And another really good article that I read is called Julius Irving Doesn't Want to Be a Hero Anymore by Robert Hoover. The links to all of these and a lot more are included in the notes below. Thanks for enjoying another episode of I'll Tell You What. Don't forget to follow and subscribe everywhere you can. Please leave a podcast review as well. If you want to support the show, grab some merch or give a financial token of thanks, you can do so by heading to the links in the notes below. Come back next week as we reflect on yet another wonderful love story. See you in the pews.